Okay. So let's begin and thank you for uh, arriving a little later today. I'm sorry if some of you had some confusion because it wasn't very clear the other day. Mondays we will start later at 10.15. I think there is another Monday left, so it's not such a big problem. Uh, if any of you didn't give me your name or contact uh, email address, please. This is for the people who need marks, not in general, but if... Okay. Because I will have to leave, make a list of students and collect your problems and so on, just to make sure everybody that's what you should. Whatever you want. I mean, if, before I leave, give me some time if you want. I don't know because you, you give a problem like last Friday, but we have a specific deadline. Or? No, I mean, no, I'm flexible on that. Just give them to me and okay. so that they have time before I leave sure. uh, to correct them. And uh, I will do my best. Okay, so. Now that you remind me, because I forgot, there was another problem left from the other day. I didn't have time to put it in the blackboard. It's a very easy one. Uh, so you remember that we were working with transmission lines, which were cables propagating microwaves. Uh, if you will miss the lectures, there is a link to the videos. I think David has it. If not, you can ask me and I can provide it with you, to you. And there is also the material that I put on the on the web, which is uh, the transcript of my, my script for the lectures, okay? So the, the idea is that we studied an open boundary uh, transmission line with two cuts that are two capacitors, and we found the eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies of this uh, guy. And I just would like to ask you to do the same thing for a line that is shorted. So it's connected to ground. Uh, physically, well, this one is a coplanar waveguide with two ground planes surrounding a core that transports the microwaves, so these are connected to ground. And the only difference is that this, instead of being cut, is just connected to the same ground. Okay. So what you have to do is to find the right binary conditions. can reuse the quantization that we did the other day. Uh, find the eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies. And justify why this is called a lambda fourth resonator. And finally, we did uh, estimates of the voltage and, uh, and intensity of the currents at the zero point and also for the different modes. Uh, and I want you to estimate this, uh, well, write the formulas and then estimate them for a line with an impedance, typical impedance of 50 ohm. And, uh, uh, fundamental mode frequency of uh, 4 gigahertz. Just use those numbers and get the, the right quantities. Okay, so it's just recycling what we did the other day in a slightly different context. This uh, type of uh, cavities is not so much used. Typically we want to have uh, like one input port to drive the cavity and one output port to measure it. But there are contexts where this is very useful, for instance, when people are studying uh, driven resonators, where you can put things here at the boundary to change the, the effective length of the cavity. This is used in, the, in, in Chalmers to study the dynamical Casimir effect and other related experiments with um, parametric amplifiers. So we will, we will probably meet them in upcoming lectures. Can I erase it? No. 
So that's, that's it. As I said, just write them on a paper, do the best you can, give them to me, and uh, if you give them with sufficient time, I can give them back corrected. They are not very difficult, it's just to make sure you follow up the lectures. And now we are going to change gears because uh, we have spent a lot of time on uh, what is the easiest thing, which are linear elements, photons, uh, microwave photons. And now we are going to go into the nonlinear regime, which is provided by Josephson junctions. And we saw already how these junctions work, how they uh, introduce nonlinear elements into the Hamiltonian. But we are now really going to find out different regimes where they can be used. And today we are going to start with a qubit design, which is ancient, it's very old, and as I will show you, it's not uh, from the superconducting world. So it's the charged qubit. The idea is that we are going to use charge states to describe, or no, to implement the qubits. And uh, just to show you that this idea is really not from here. Uh, this is a transparency a slide uh, with some pictures from uh, quantum dots. Let me switch off the lights. So another thing that I'm doing is that I don't no longer have two PDFs with uh, pictures on the script. I, I, I copy these pictures into my notes. So you only have one file to download. Uh, so if you go to the web, you will find this. Don't, don't worry about it. So this is a, a semiconductor material uh, with a quantum well, a two-dimensional well, uh, of, uh, where there are electrons moving into the, to the electron gas. And what you see there is some uh, electrodes that create uh, like uh, isolation or barriers where the electrons don't like to enter. So in the end, as you see though, there in the shady area, there are like two dots, two gray dots below the electrodes, which could, in principle, host a number of electrons in those wells. Uh, now, what happens is that electron, the, the number of electrons is a quantized quantity. Just, electrons don't disappear from the material. They can move somewhere else to other materials, like other layers and so on, but these are insulating, or, and so they stay there. So if you put an electron in one of those semicircles, it will stay there. So in the end what happens is that uh, you, can, you can put so many electrons in that hole. In, in, in general, you will try, the material will try to achieve charge neutrality. If you don't do anything, the number of electrons has to equal the number of uh, positively charged ions in the material. So the total charge is zero. But you can inject electrons one by one by applying an external voltage that makes larger and larger charges more favorable. Okay, and you see that these are uh, pictures from such experiments where they measure the, the, the charges in the two islands. And you see that as uh, you change the, the voltages on those electrodes, there are discontinuities and one r jumps from one configuration to a different one. So one may start with uh, no charges. It may be favorable to have a charge on one dot, on the right, on the other dot, on the left. We may increase the voltage and the number of electrons that you can put inside increases. Increases this continuously, okay? So there are transitions. And, and this, this happens just because of quantization of, of the charge, because there is Coulomb repulsion. So I mean, you, don't, you cannot put as many electrons as you want in a, in a small region, a small volume, because they triple each other. And because we are working in a somewhat linear regime where uh, the energy grows quadratically with the charge, as we are going to see. But there is nothing superconducting here. And what we are going to do is we are going to copy this idea uh, to, the, to the superconducting world. The reference for all the things I'm going to tell uh, today is this uh, review of modern physics from 2000, uh, from Gershon and collaborators, where they describe the early stages of uh, superconducting devices, superconducting qubits in this case, uh, how they were uh, implemented and characterized and so on. So this is uh, three years before the birth of CQQD. So 
So all the things I'm going to tell you, they, you can find them there, uh, explained with great detail. So I'm going to uh, basically outline the ideas. Uh, and we are going to work through the Hamiltonians in, in different ways. So it will be, some will be more qualitatively, qualitative, some will be more uh, based on secret quantization, and there will be even uh, um, ultra collatum analogy to these uh, qubits. So the starting point is that we have uh, some island, some piece of metal that you can charge. And I'm going to call the number of carriers N. N is the number of carriers minus the number that you would have at equilibrium. Which, when you have that the total charge of the material is, is zero. Okay. Uh, so as I told you, in a material there, is, there are always electrons because they have to compensate the charge of the ions that host them. And we are only going to consider differences of charge with respect to neutrality. Hmm? Now, this number is human goals. Okay. So you have lots of zeros there. And this is a very weak perturbation on top of that number. That is what allows us to work in a somewhat linear regime, where we consider only the linear and quadratic corrections to the energy induced by adding more and more uh, electrons here. If you want, you can do a careful, uh, uh, this I think it's called a, a jelly model for the electrons living in this positively charged crystal, where this plasma is uh, really studied more quantitatively and you can develop a theory for it and okay, fi justify this linearized theory. But I'm just going to uh, work with it, like we have done so far with circuits. So the idea is that uh, you have an excess, in this case, of carriers, which are Cooper pairs. This leads to a charge. This is negative. And the energy is going to be uh, influenced by some external electrode that in induces some uh, gate voltage. So there is a voltage here that is influencing uh, what is the ground state configuration of this metallic island, superconductor in this case. So what uh, I write down, uh, quadratic approximation to the energy of this system, and it looks as follows. Where u is proportional to the external voltage. So I have uh, some charging energy, uh, an energy that costs me to add more and more particles. It grows quadratically because that's basically proportional to the number of repulsive interactions that you can have between the electrons in the material, and that grows quadratically with the number of particles. Okay. So if you have, if we are linearizing the, the, the interactions between particles, the number of pairs grows like n, n minus one half, and this fits into this uh, repulsive energy. And then we assume that there is a linear contribution to the energy that tries to bring down the charge, or up, which is this uh, potential, this is proportional to the gate voltage that we are applying. So, now, we have this qualitative theory, we will justify it later. And we can now write what are the energies of different physical configurations? Because you, you have to remember that Q is not just anything, it's uh, quantized. So we have to uh, look at the energies of these configurations as a function of N. So we start, for instance, with uh, n equals zero, would be here. We can put uh, 
This requires some careful dry drawing, but I mean, it's always better in the PDF. One and two will be there. Notice that this is uh, unharmonic, so they are not equally spaced. So the energy of uh, one is uh, one over two C, proportional to that. So the energy of this guy is uh, four E squared divided by two C. But the energy of uh, that other configuration is four times that. So it's up there. This is four times. Uh, I will try to write this larger. But so this, this should be a little bit. That means, in principle, we could make transitions between these two states without even accessing that third state there. But still, this, the separation between these two energy levels is too, too large. So what we do is we apply this uh, external potential, and uh, we have uh, that the, the energies are shifted. Okay? So we have this guy. This guy looks something like this. They are shifted towards the right. And you see that uh, what I achieve with this is that while preserving the unharmonicity, I can make certain levels become close to each other and transition from a regime where the ground state would be In this case, the ground state it will be zero, and here the ground state will be one, and here the ground state will be two. So I have different configurations, and I can bring uh, uh, two levels arbitrarily close to each other to a meeting point where they become degenerate. Okay, at that point, I should be able to make quantum superpositions of those two states which have the same energy. That's the idea. And when they are degenerate, anything else is unharmonic because anything else is way away, uh, away in the spectrum. Okay? And these, uh, these transitions amount to the discrete changes that I showed you before for the quantum dot. So basically we, we shift from different configurations. Okay, so um, This is not quantum at all. Okay? There is nothing quantum here, except for the fact that we have discrete balls, which are electrons that I put in and out of my material, and that are uh, repelling each other. When I would have quantum effects is whenever I can have really coherent superpositions of these states. And that is what's missing in this Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian, doesn't have quantum fluctuations. It's diagonal in a configuration basis. I don't need quantum states to describe this. This could be just diagonal density matrices. So I need to add something to the picture to make, uh, make it possible to create coherence between charge zero and one, or between one and two, and so on. And so what do I need here? would physically allow me to have superpositions between zero and one. What kind of perturbation? What does this perturbation do to the material? It's an escape of the charges from the Yeah. So you need to be able to inject and extract charges because so far in this picture, the number of particles is uh, constant. Okay? So it's a configuration. Uh, how these electrons came into the island it's not my, no, none of my business. This is a very classical picture. So what I need to add to this picture is some a kind of uh, source or, or sink of particles that allows them to tunnel in and out of the material. So this looks like this. Over here. I have a 
Josephson Junction, and here I have a reservoir. Uh, that's that's uh, somehow the picture I have in mind. I'm going to treat this reservoir as being in some kind of coherent state, so to say, so that if I inject and extract particles from there, I'm not going to bother about the changes in this system, so that everything is going to be coherent. We can make it more precise later on. But then uh, there is a change in this, uh, in this image, in the sense that uh, the Hamiltonian that I have to consider now looks more like a quantum Hamiltonian. And it will contain the same ingredients for the energy of the particles. But we now have tunneling in and out of, of carriers. Okay? So still, everything is hand-waving. I'm not uh, justifying this in any way. Just, uh, this is my model for uh, particles tunneling in and out of the system. And I write, write a Hamiltonian that is uh, very democratic. Any configuration can tunnel to any other configuration, provided that we have uh, this source. Now, what you realize is, uh, if, I, if I zoom in this picture, I have a crossing of levels. At this point, they become degenerate. So my Hamiltonian around this point looks like This would be um, it looks like this. So basically, I have some uh, what I would call the equilibrium charge. It is the charge I would like that my system would like to have. It's proportional to to u. Around this point, I only care ab about uh, 0 and 1 because 2 is high up in energy, so it's going to be far from this picture. But I allow, uh, I consider what is the effect of this tunneling in and out of, uh, of the island, uh, introducing this correction. This is it. Okay. And if you can read this. So, the energy of uh, one goes down with this uh, equilibrium charge and the energy of zero goes up. So this really looks like a qubit, okay? Right? So what would be this? What is this, simply? Sigma set and this? Sigma x. So that's basically all you need to uh, implement uh, a qubit Hamiltonian. And provided that you can tune these parameters, for instance, you can tune uh, this external voltage or, or you can tune the tunneling amplitude that you have there, you could, in principle, implement uh, arbitrary rotations within this two dimensional Hilbert space. Know this much of what I'm telling you is, is very basic, and you have seen this in many other contexts. But I just want to make sure we have common language. Okay, so now let's uh, try to justify this uh, in a bit more uh, careful way by uh, going back to the this bosonic fluid leak. Uh, uh, analogy that we did for the junctions. Uh, 
And the idea is that, uh, oops, I'm counting on some uh, double wall description. Uh, with uh, two reservoirs that allow charge to tunnel from one to the other through this small barrier. So if I do this double well picture and these guys are bosons, I more or less know that I can as assimilate them to the same wave function on one well and on the other. And I end up with Hamiltonian that looks like uh, it's uh, going to be Something like this is a potential energy difference. And a hopping term between them. So it's, it's a, the quantum fluid I, I we described before for the Cooper pairs, but now instead of I writing a Schrodinger equation with uh, Laplacians and potentials, I'm just working in the eigenbasis of this double well. Okay? A, A1 and A2 describe these modes in these two worlds. And what I'm describing is how uh, particles can tunnel from one side to the other. And I can have some uh, charging energy. Or just to fix notations because uh, I always get confused by these things. Uh, where is it minus? Okay, so you see. Here I'm using uh, this. It's a strange thing. I mean, this comes from the fact that people typically work with uh, electrons in quantum dots. But now we have uh, pairs of electrons. That means that the, the, the energy it takes to charge one, one extra carrier is four times the one that you would have for an electron. So it's conventions. And, uh, so that's my model. What I have is I have some equilibrium charges uh, on the walls. Uh, away from there, I have extra energy when I'm exactly at that charge, and just neutrality, nothing else is there. And uh, I can move to an eigenbasis of uh, this interaction Hamiltonian, uh, the, the charge in Hamiltonian, which is described by the average number of particles and the fluctuations. Divided by two. Uh, Sorry, I have a doubt about the convention of the name. I mean, what is N0 in the Hamiltonian? I well, it's, uh, you have in a, in a metal, you have some ions. Which are positively charged. And then you have a sea of electrons moving through it. No? That's the typical picture that we get. Okay. And, and that kind of fluid has a point of neutrality when the number of electrons match the number of ions. And what I'm sim simply introducing that number of carriers is to emphasize the fact that we are going to make fluctuations around a very large number. Okay, so that's the, the idea. So we, we are going to compute differences in, in the charges of these islands with respect to a humongo C. And that is going to allow me to rewrite this Hamiltonian in a simpler form, which is the one I did before. Okay. 
And uh, to you, it may seem like uh, like a very easy justification, but behind this, there is also the fact that this provides us a method of solving, uh, in general, the Hamiltonian for a Charles qubit or a transmo or a flask qubit and so on. Okay, so uh, now the next point is that because we have a tunneling of particles on top of a huge background, we can treat these hopping turns specially. So you would have that uh, if you apply this on one state, this uh, destroys a particle here and it moves it there. Okay, so you get a prefactor. <coughs> That's it. So the matrix elements of this guy, in principle, depend on the number of particles. But because we are working around um, neutrality, okay, what this is doing is that the average number of particles is preserved, but the imbalance between islands is shifted by a little amount. Okay? Mm. My plus one because I put the uh, one half there. You see this? So it's it's a trivial statement. Just rewrite this in the uh, different uh, variables that I gave you before, but now what you see is that this is an irrelevant contribution to the square root. Okay. So uh, you can keep here something like this. And, uh, and that's the justification for what I wrote before, of uh, tunneling of particles in and out of this uh, reservoir, or in this case, of a double uh, island. Okay, so you massage your things and, and you will rewrite this guy again. Okay, that's because of my choice of something that has a very similar form uh, to what I wrote before. Excuse me? Yeah? Shouldn't the state after applying A to layer A1 be F and minus 1? You're right. Yes, because I chose one and one minus n two. That's true. And uh, so, basically, what I wanted to show is that you get exactly the same shape, quadratic and linear terms, and then this uh, humongous tunneling uh, matrix that involves all possible states. Which, for our uh, approximations, this will only couple two possible configurations. Yeah. Uh, so now let's go back for a second. So keep this in mind. We have this picture of particle numbers. And let's go back to the, to the circuits that I drew before. Okay. Can I erase this? So I'm going to go back to the previous circuit and write it in a electrical circuit language. 
And I'm doing this uh, jumping back and forth between these two notions because it's useful to, uh, it's, it provides us with a tool to solve numerically the Hamiltonians associated to arbitrary superconducting circuits, okay? So you have this idea of particles hopping in and out of the island. We had uh, this circuit with some gate voltage, the number of particles, and then tunneling in and out. And I'm going to write down the equivalent circuit for this guy, which looks as follows. So basically, I have my superconducting island will be this. Uh, which can be affected by an external voltage through some coupling matrix. And there is the possibility of particles tunneling in and out of the reservoir. So I have shifted things a little bit, like the voltage is applied uh, to, to this guy instead to this one, but basically it's always the same uh, effective circuit. So you can put it on the other side, doesn't really matter. Uh, oh no, so this is the island, sorry. This is the island. So the uh, Cooper pairs are dancing inside this region. They are affected by the external voltage and they can tunnel in and out of the, of the island. So we do uh, the typical circuit theory. I have to identify the nodes of this graph. They include uh, three nodes, 0, A, and B. I draw a path. Um, and fix some conventions on, on the direction. So this would be my path along this line. But as you remember, uh, we are going typically to neglect the, the flux here because actually there is no flux in there. It's just a representation for two possible physical processes that can affect the same island, but they take place through an open construct. So it's not it's just representing this point. There is no possibility of flux there. And now going to fix uh, directions of uh, intensity in this direction, this direction, and this direction. So that I have that the intensity that travels through the junction is equal to the intensity that travels to the capacitor minus the intensity that travels induced by the voltage, the external voltage that I had before. This is going to be the first to last time I do this procedure because as uh, I will show you in a second, we can derive Hamiltonian directly, as I argued before. So you have this. Uh, it's convenient to have the capacitors on one side because they will contain all the derivatives of the flux, and on the other side, the, the inductors, so that we can do things like this. And uh, if I didn't make any mistake, then this should look like this. So. This will be the critical current of your junction. The sine of phi A 2 pi divided by C, uh, this quantum flux. Because I assume that this is at zero voltage, that's my reference. So this is one variable, and this is going to be another variable, but this variable is fixed by the voltage, as we had before. So we saw this with a LC resonator. Means phi zero, zero and phi dot b is equal to b. 
We have the current through the capacitor, uh, which is proportional to the capacitance of this junction. And we have the induced current uh, by this voltage, which can be time dependent. Okay? So we are considering all possible situations. There is no approximation thus far. Okay, so integrate uh, to get the Lagrangians. So we have to look at this guy and look at this guy and find where they come from. And you will notice that it's slightly different from what you would expect. So the, the charge qubit contains a capacitive energy term, which of course is uh, shifted by the external voltage but the, the capacitance is not just the capacitance of the junction is uh, influenced by the coupling to the to the environment or to the external voltage and in addition to this you have cosine uh, the inductive energy, which is non linear and is provided by the tunneling junction. Okay, so I, I, did I lose you so far? You follow, more or less? So it's, it's basically the same thing we did for the LC resonator, but the only uh, consideration is that now we have a non linear term instead of a an, an inductor. And uh, so that means the Hamiltonian we have gotten is basically the same one that we got if you replace this with uh, 1 over 2L minus phi A square. Phi A square. This will be for the LC resonator. And uh, we can. Uh, compute uh, the rest of remaining operators and arrive to the final Hamiltonian. So the charge uh, is uh, influenced by the external voltage this uh, kind of things is what makes, me, makes it messy to go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. Now you have to invert phi dot in terms of Q and compute this thing, which uh, ends up looking like No. This is of the action energy associated to that. Okay, so it's a uh, is the analogous of the LC uh, oscillator. But we have replaced the inductive energy with this uh, nonlinear form. Okay? So the difference uh, is basically the difference between having a parabola. and a cosine. So you notice that for, for, uh, 
for weak uh, say for weak changes in the flux both of them can be assimilated one to another so the, the, the nonlinear inductor can be assimilated to a linear inductor whose uh, effective inductance can be inferred from this or from the critical current and so on But the problem is that, okay, I have written this electrical circuit, Hamiltonian, but it doesn't tell me anything about what are the configurations of this problem. So this tells me, of course, if I look at this part, this is the reasoning I had before, but if I look at this guy, I don't know what to do with it. So if I uh, want to solve the eigenstates of this problem, I need to, be, to have a method to deal with this uh, Hamiltonian and this representation. Okay. And this is what we are going to do after the break. <laughs> so re regarding your question about the time frame for the problems, March the 7th is the last lecture and on 9th and 10th I have to be in Munich so and I'm leaving on the 11th so more or less try to provide them to me before that the full calendar of lecturers is in the web page with uh, updated times in case we change them okay so uh, we started with a qualitative model for the charge qubit based just on the quantization of the charge. We moved on to a model that includes accounts also for tunneling in and out of particles in a quantum fashion. And now it took you back to the circuit. Uh, and the reason I, I did that is that because we arrived at something that in principle doesn't seem to have anything to do with that tunneling. Um, which is something we are going to face, be faced with uh, again and again, which is nonlinear functions of the flux combined with quadratic potentials for the charges. So the funny thing is that the model that we have done for the charge qubit can be mapped to this Hamiltonian that you have here. And we are going to do it in a very uh, simple way but uh, by, by going to the basis that I, I drew before. So this is what loop. I'm going to introduce again the number of carriers in the island and I'm going to change basis because I know that this is a good basis for this guy but I don't know what to do with this guy. So the next thing I, I realize is that this actually defines a phase. It is uh, the, the phase difference between the two sides of the junction as we discussed it for, the, for that macroscopic quantum model. So I'm going to create phase states for these numbers. So I'm going to introduce a new basis of states that uh, look like this. So it's a completely delocalized state over all possible occupation numbers. So I allow for all possible charges. So this guy is uh, really unphysical. We cannot prepare such state. And uh, you notice that we involve all integers because as I told you, we can have positive but as well as negative charges because it's just different with respect to a background. I'm, uh, I'm going to assimilate this phase with the phase of the superconductor. Okay. But now let me try to justify it, why this is true. So the first thing is that we, we don't work um, with these states, we work with wave packets. Okay. We have a wave packet which uh, regularizes this. idea makes it more uh, useful where there is this wave function and because uh, the phase is periodic we are going to impose that this guy is periodic
periodic as well. Now, let me take this arbitrary quantum state, which I could also write in the basis of numbers, and see how different operators act on this state. The operators that we found in the qualitative model were basically the number operator and some ladder operators that tunnel particles in and out. I'm going to write S dagger, which is the adjoint of S minus. And with that, we, we wrote down this uh, qualitative model for the double junction. And now I'm going to take this operator and I'm going to act with this on this state with some care. You have N acting on psi. And in principle, I would have to put it inside here, but because I don't know how it acts on phi, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace phi with the uh, expressions that I wrote above. So this is this. And then we have the sum of all possible configurations, 2 pi e to the minus n phi, and then n, n, integrated over phi. And now this, this is what we really know how the number operator acts, no? It's just C number, okay? In this case, this creates an additional factor on the wave function. But, uh, well, this is not really useful. I would like to, to see how it affects the wave packet. Okay? I would like to write this as some operator acting on psi integrated over the phases. So I, I want to see how it would act on this uh, wave packets. And uh, the trick is to realize that I can pull down this number by applying n on n, but I can also pull it down by differentiating the exponential. Okay? So I can, I can see this. as the result of differentiation, differ, uh, differentiating, taking derivatives over this function of, of the phase. And uh, because uh, psi is periodic, phi is periodic, I can now take this derivative, integrating my parts, and pull it onto the uh, wave packet. So I can integrate this by parts, simply changes the sign of the derivative, And you get here psi phi. There's nothing too mysterious in it. So far, it, it just looks like tricks, okay, mathematical tricks. But it establishes that in, the, in this language, the operator n is mapped to the derivative of the phase. The next uh, guy we have to change or, or map into this language is the ladder operator, S plus. I simply wrote what is the action of this operator onto the state. Okay. So what would be then the equivalent action onto the wave packet? Can you see it here? 
So I, I want to recover the expression for phi for the states for the states psi here. Okay, I want to recover the psi. So what do I need to bring this back into this form? So I would need to add here this. Okay, if I add it here, I simply take it out and it's there. Okay. So basically, I'm just transforming the the wave packet. with this uh, exponential. Okay. And, uh, had any of you seen this phase number representation before in quantum optics or in other contexts? Yeah, it's very usual. It's uh, full of uh, subtleties, but in our context where we are really working with uh, an infinite background of particles is not too problematic. But now what you can do is you can uh, rephrase uh, general Hamiltonian of this form you have this Hamiltonian which includes some uh, energy repulsion between particles uh, and, and also some shifts due to uh, external potentials. I write this in this form and you will arrive to So it's really uh, the form that we had before. This is basically uh, Q square divided to C, or whatever, or with uh, some possible shift. And then you have here minus just as of, just of some energy and then the phase difference in the superconductor. Okay, so in this case, it's uh, I mean it's, it's a simple uh, derivation. We we found it first qualitatively, and then we have found the circuit. But it's true that whenever you face a complicated quantum circuit described in terms of fluxes, flux differences, flux derivatives, and so on, charges, it's useful for doing numerics to move back to this representation. So you simply replace uh, the phases of your junctions with the appropriate operators in the number representation, and working in this basis of number operators, you diagonalize the resulting Hamiltonian. For us, uh, it really make, doesn't make such a huge difference. It's simply telling you now that in this model, 2t is equal to ej. Okay? So it's telling you how the different quantities of your qubit Hamiltonian and your qubit representation in the charge basis map in this context. So you have that our Kiwi Hamiltonian looks like a sigma x term that uh, accounts for tunneling. And now we would have to uh, consider this term around the numbers of particles that we are working with, which I'm going to focus in 0 and 1. So that this looks like um, this will be okay. 
or I'm assuming that it's proportional. Something like this. So you, your external field, external potential, is uh, drifting around uh, one half by some small value, and this induces a shift of energies that is almost linear, as we saw before. So that you would have this kind of model, an avoided cross, uh, a real crossing without the Josephson junction, and then these energy levels once you introduce it. So the uh, eigenergies of this problem they are of this form And they form uh, these two hyperbolas, qubit hyperbola is called. The minimum energy is achieved when this guy is zero, is the external potential that shifts your uh, charge states up and down. They would be degenerated at this point if there was no junction, but because there is a junction, you have an energy difference which is equal to Ej. Okay, you follow this more or less? And we have different configurations uh, around this uh, phase space. So there are very various limits. Yes. At the generacy, when epsilon is zero, then the eigenstates uh, are the eigenstates of sigma x so that you would have at the bottom here and at the top the two states which are coherent superpositions of uh, different charges in the island when you increase epsilon, this brings the state one down. So that here, charge is mostly one, and here, charge is mostly zero. And in between, well, you have to compute the mixing angle between uh, the different charge configurations to get the right uh, state. Okay, and now. This model is really fully quantum because you see that we have a coherent superposition of two physically distinct observables, and we have two bases, zero and one, and plus and minus to play with. So we can really make sophisticated things like uh, non commuting measurements and things like that. Um, some considerations are about these states. Uh, well, one thing is that uh, because this energy can be large, can be of order of few gigahertz, you can uh, safely assume that if you don't do anything, you will end up in one of these ground states, depending on your external potentials. This is not completely true because, I mean, uh, these superpositions, they have different charges, okay? And the environment may see them, so the, the, the environment that interacts with the superconducting island may couple to that degree of freedom, and it can do a measurement of the charge and decohere the state. So that's always something that has to be taken into account. But let's assume that we are not waiting so long there are different operation points. This one is, for obvious reason, called the symmetry point. 
and we will face it in different qubits, is the place where, in this case, the derivative of the energy is minimal, it's around zero. So we expect that the fluctuations of the energy around there are going to be smaller by when influenced by external fields. The other thing is that we will see now in the design, the actual designs, that EJ uh, doesn't have to be fixed. We will use squids instead of just junctions to control this height. That's something that can be done. As you move away, you have a better defined value of the charge uh, than in the center. So that also you have a different dipole moment. And this may influence how you couple to the, to the external fields. And now there are different things that we can do with this qubit. So just looking at the Hamiltonian and assuming that I have control over, for instance, the junction, more difficult, or the applied voltage. Okay. This is the true. What I'm going to discuss now is true for all possible qubits. So it's a rather general, and you probably know already. But basically, the three, well, five things that we can do are the following ones. We can just I mean, our goal This would be a goal just uh, from the point of view of having one qubit. This is what I, I wrote in this cooking list at the beginning of the lectures. If you want to design a qubit, things you want to do with it, you want to be able to prepare it in a well-defined state, and you want to be able to, to manipulate that state with arbitrary rotations. Rotations means unitary transformations, which in principle, they may take any direction in the Hilbert space, okay? This sigma is just the vector of Pauli matrices. You have the block sphere. You choose a direction of rotation, and you rotate your qubit state around it by some angle. So in, in general, when you look at quantum information protocols, typically one is assuming Implicitly, most, most of the time, that this is available as a resource for your computation. Uh, but I have written this guy here. Okay. I've written this guy with just two control parameters. And there are Pauli matrices missing there. So we will see that there are operations which are easy to do, and there are operations that require a little bit more work. The easiest thing is what I mentioned before, is to prepare a well-defined charge state. You can prepare Zero or one. You have the qubit hyperbola. Here and here. Well, it looks more like a parabola, but anyway. You start with a very large electric field away from symmetry point, weight, and the, if there was some excited population, it decays down. It. The qubit emits spontaneously all the excess energy because the temperature of our system is going to be of the order of tens of millikelvin and this is going to be of the order of gigahertz. I will, at the very least. Now, the other thing that we can do is once we are in a position somewhere here, for instance here, is that we can prepare other ground states. 
<laughs> so we can move left and right and make this guy continuously and gradually change into other ground states at different positions in this hyperbola. The idea is that you have what is called the adiabatic theorem. You have your Hamiltonian depends on time, has some external perturbation. For instance, this could be of the form uh, uh, of this form, where the electric potential uh, is evolves slowly. Okay. So, provided that. Uh, the rate <coughs> at which you change the energy. So basically when you move from here to here, what one thing that the only energy scale that you are changing is the gap. is the only thing you have to compare with. Provided that this gap is changing slowly, you expect, according to this theorem, that you will remain in the ground state of your Hamiltonian. Okay. So the conditions that is typically written is that this velocity of change has to be small. You, this defines a rate a time of changing, one over v, and t, t has to be much larger than 1 over the minimum uh, energy gap that the qubit faces through the dynamics. So the qubit is experiencing a time-dependent gap, and the, the changes of this gap has to be always slower than the gap it's seeing. If you use this assumption, you can go to Wikipedia and you find the derivation of the adiabatic theorem. It's a very simple uh, derivation based on ordinary differential equations. You find it also in Landau, Sinner's work, and so other, there are many derivations around, but the idea is always that you change your Hamiltonian slowly compared to the energy scales you have to play with. Okay? The ground state energy is just a shift, so it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the energy difference in this case. Sorry, may you give us some order of magnitude over time, for example, for the preparation Well, look at this. So this is uh, gigahertz. Okay. So you can change your fields in the order of tens of megahertz or hundreds of megahertz, and it will still be safe. And so you will still be able to move around. Uh, yep. Yeah. That's the adiabatic limit. There is another limit that is uh, used more in a experiments, which is uh, used, it's called the diabatic or uh, abrupt change, or instantaneous change, or however you want to call it. So it's precisely the opposite one. So you are going to change your Hamiltonian in a time scale that is much faster than the system has to react. So now you're going to do it the other way. So tau is going to be much, much shorter than the, than the time scales that the qubit has to evolve. If you do that, you can apply uh, different kinds of perturbation theory and study the changes, but uh, there is a very simple uh, intuition of what's going on. So basically, the uh, adiabatic limit is that you, you remain in this curve. Okay? The uh, intermediate regime would be that you do it in a speed that is comparable to this gap, and then what happens is once you reach this point, there is some probability of excitation and some probability of remaining in the ground state. So your, your probability is distributed between both, and your, your qubit is in a superposition of being in the ground state and in an excited state. The, the amount of excited state population it's given by landau Center theory. It's, very, it's an exponential of, of the rapidity that you have. And the limit in which you do it abruptly, what happens is that you move from here to here. 
basically. Because that's the place in energy space of this state that didn't have time to react to your changes in the Hamiltonian. So basically, you are in the state zero, suddenly your Hamiltonian changes to be this Hamiltonian, and the position of your state in the, in the energy is up there. So you have changed the energies, but you have not changed the state. Okay? Or, or vice versa, you can go from here to here. What would be the state that you have there? You, you, you start here, and suddenly you shift to this point. It's still zero. But you can write it in the uh, eigenbasis of this point, which will be zero. Of this form, okay. So you have a superposition of both the ground state and the excited state. Okay, we will see that. I mean, this is uh, describing an actual experiment uh, that proves the existence of the charge qubit. Okay, um, more things that you can do that are basically for free. stupid thing. You evolve according to the Hamiltonian that you have at any given time in your experiment. So you simply uh, shift, uh, shift, switch uh, diabatically your parameters, place yourself in some point in space, values of uh, delta and epsilon or Ej and the external potential, and your Hamiltonian is now this one, and you evolve for a certain period of time with that. So the unitary that you get is just e to the minus i h uh, t. Okay, you, you don't change the Hamiltonian for a certain period of time and you get that unitary for free. Uh, as I told you, this doesn't cover all possible unitaries. But it covers some cases. It covers, for instance, for free, in this language, h, this rotation. So it's, it's there for free. Now, you have other combinations, and because they, they are uh, linearly independent, you can, with a combination of one configuration of the Hamiltonian and another com com configuration of the Hamiltonian, try to generate other unitaries by composition. Okay? So you can make, compose uh, more sophisticated unitaries by changing the parameters delta and epsilon and this works very well in practice because the other limit that you have for free it would be uh, where epsilon is uh, much larger than delta where h is of the order of sigma set in this case so I mean you have at least two approx one exact rotation and sigma x and one approximate rotation is in mass set. And if you go to composition of uh, rotations, you know that with a couple of angles, you can reproduce any other direction that you want in the block sphere. So using uh, a combination of diabatic changes and waiting times, you can drive the dynamics of your states according to any local transformation that you wish. What problems does this have? What problems would you find in this approach to do an experiment? Well, one is limited by this adiabatic theorem, right? Diabatic 
changes, how fast you can switch your fields. The other one is uh, how large you can make them. Okay? So you want to make epsilon very large compared to delta to avoid errors. But one problem that happens is that uh, as you increase the energy gap of your system, the spontaneous emission rate go grows with the, uh, with the gap. Uh, that means that there is more chance of recoherence and the qubit being lost as you increase the, the, the potential. Okay? So this is, in, in theory, for, for, for a theoretician, one would be happy with that. Right? One writes a PRL and then uh, goes home, and then that's all. But in practice, that's not really desirable. And, and so some, uh, one has to find alternatives. And the alternative uh, is driving. Uh, with uh, time dependent perturbations. In this case, you can apply a time dependent voltage that will excite your system. Uh, because we don't have uh, a lot of time left today, and this requires a couple of blackboards by itself. Let's see if we can have a look at least uh, at uh, how the qubits look in reality. Um, where are the first uh, instances of these qubits? Um, hey, is it there? Okay. Wow, this is challenging. Where is my finger? Oh, bastard. <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> it's very useful. When you, work, you, when you grow older, you will find it useful to have it around. Unless you go to many parties and th ballrooms and things like that. Okay. Oh, now it's locked. I love LibreOffice because it's very easy to have it around, but it's really messy. I'm sorry for this. Uh, Let's see, we have... Um, just keep it. you this picture but before that there were some experiments in other groups this is an experiment in the group of Sacle, Daniel Steph, Michel de Poret and other people uh, what you see at the top is this uh, junction with a superconducting island uh, paired within two other superconductors and then an external voltage source there and this is coupling to some uh, electrometer a single electron transistor that they designed to measure basically the charge of the island and this is what they saw. So they saw that uh, by changing the external voltage that they apply to the island, they can uh, cycle through different plateaus where the charge is uh, quantized in units of the Cooper pairs. But this is not yet a coherent operation of the qubit. For that, you have to improve a little bit the design. So one thing that you can do, for instance, is you can tune uh, the Josephson energy in addition to the external potential, there is this, uh, here there is a loop 
with two junctions. This is the superconducting island, and there is a probe. And uh, this loop creates a flux-dependent Josephson junction. It's kind of a squid. We will see it at some point. There is the external voltage applied to the junction or to the reservoir. It doesn't really matter. And the circuit is a little bit uh, more complicated than the one I, I drew, but the, the idea is, is very similar. You can change, again, the desired charge at the, at, the at the island by discrete units, but you can also now have coherent superpositions and play with uh, the gap at different points uh, of the qubit hyperbola. So what they did, uh, I'm going to draw it on the blackboard. It's a very clever idea to prove that you have coherence they have the qubit hyperbola something like this and they start at a given point, say here Okay, so that, that means that your state is mostly zero and now they change the potential to go to the symmetry point. What happens is that the state remains the same initially, but now these two guys, one is the ground state, one, the other one is the excited state, they evolve with different energy. So after Another time, you would have uh, that this is oscillating. This oscillation take, takes place uh, on the x-plane, but uh, it's affecting, so let's, this is no longer now, Zero, this is now psi of t, okay? Where this would be psi at zero. And now uh, what they do is they, after certain time, they stop and go back to this point and they measure the charge. And if you uh, redo this uh, state in the charge basis, you would have that this goes So that the charge uh, is oscillating in time, depending on the waiting time that you spend in this uh, region. Okay? So you start here, shift here, wait for a time, and then go back and measure. And uh, depending on the time that you wait, you will get at the output a different charge. Why is this so? Well, it's so because you have a junction that allows charge to oscillate in and out of the island. Okay, so that is what this is describing. Yes. So it's, it's something physically going on there. Now the time scales for this switching, they are fast, uh, faster than the minimum gap that they get. I mean, it's faster than gigahertz or comparable to that. But one thing that is very important is that these oscillations, they take place in a time scale of the energy gap of the qubit, which is very fast. So it's gigahertz. Uh, that's not the typical qubit manipulation time scale that we are going to see in CQQD experiments. So the reason why they can see these uh, oscillations is because they are indeed very fast. This is what you see there. So they, they, they have a waiting time in terms of picoseconds, that's very short, and the charge uh, changes in time with a period that allows them to characterize the Josephson energy. And because they have uh, a flux dependent on Josephson uh, energy, they can see that in the, this prediction of the period matches what is the junction energy that they are producing. Now I think I copied the coherence times, so uh, this experiment is not good. After two nanoseconds, they have lost the qubit. Uh, I think it's, this is T1, but maybe the facing. So basically, the coherence is very fast. Okay. 
So the only reason why I told you that you see this is because they are working with the energy scales of uh, qubit oscillations, not the interaction of the qubit with other things like rapid frequencies and so on. And, and this is uh, these experiments. They are, uh, of course, in the original papers, but uh, this is uh, Nature. But it's also in this review of modern physics by uh, Sean, Nirma, and other people. But it's very nicely explained. And uh, at that point, it seemed that these were very bad qubits. If you have the coherence time of nanoseconds, that means time scales of gigahertz, not, not very good for operation. So we had to switch to other designs to get better qubits. And I'm going to stop here. So this will be a picture of a charged qubit in the experiment in, the, in jail, where they use a superconducting island. It's this little tiny bar that you see there, coupled to a ground plane with a uh, flux dependent Jessup's junction, but the difference is that this is inside a cavity. So this is inside a microwave resonator and inside a, a waveguide. So this would be the, the ground plane of the waveguide and do, that would be the central conductor. Uh, that somehow seems to enhance the lifetime of the qubit because now it has less channels to decohere. If you compare this with the experiment by Nakamura, but this was really connected to Hemongos playing with one electrode coming here, one probe information coming here. There is a lot of potential for coupling to things that they cohere quickly. Here, the charge qubit is confined inside the cavity, and it's, uh, it has a longer lifetime. So, I think I copied the numbers there, and this, in this case, is uh, the, the, the the coherence rate of the qubit is 0 0.7 megahertz. So it's down times of microseconds, whereas uh, the gap is five gigahertz. So it's Again, uh, something that you can you can use an experiment for doing qubit operations, and we can stop here. We continue on Wednesday at nine fifteen, right?